Welcome to the Compounders Podcast. On this show, we explore the topic of compounding from various angles, including through interviews with public and private company executives, investors who focus on compounders, and newer investment firms that are building a business they hope will become more valuable over time. All opinions expressed by your hosts and the podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of SNN or its affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not investment advice and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending the purchase or sale of any securities. The host and guests may be beneficial owners of the securities discussed. You should not assume that the securities discussed are or will be profitable. My guest on the show today is Chet Rostogi, partner and portfolio manager of Heron Bay Capital Management. Chet is a seasoned investor who helps the firm run both its discretionary and systematic strategies. In this interesting conversation, we discussed Heron Bay's definition of a quality company, what it means to be a good steward of clients' capital, why the firm employs both discretionary and systematic strategies, how he thinks about concentration in both types of strategies, and the case for continuing to run a microcap strategy. And without any further ado, here's my conversation with Chet Rostogi of Heron Bay Capital Management. Heron Bay strives to be stewards of family wealth. What are the elements of being a good steward in your mind? Uh, hi, Ben. First of all, thanks for having me on the podcast. Uh, I have truly enjoyed uh, uh, the podcast and the content you guys have put out, you know. So um, uh, so thanks for that. Uh, coming to a uh, question, um, you know, we are... We are um, just to give you a little bit of context, you know, uh, we started about four years ago and um, the initial set of people that started the firm, we all come from an institutional background. In fact, that's pretty much predominantly what we used to do. And uh, so when when you look at the institutional uh, side of things, it comes with its own constraints. You know, uh, there are things like, for instance, uh, uh, you have... Uh, Turnover may not necessarily be a concern. Uh, sector representation of all sectors may be important to your institutional client. As we got, um, as we start, kept doing this, we realized that, of course, there's a lot of great things about the institutional space. I mean, you have to have strong risk controls. You have to have a, a, a well-defined process. Essentially, you have to line up and hit the ball the same way every time. And uh, um, uh, so that you have a repeat, uh, repeatable outcome. So all those things are great, but one of the things we realized that uh, it was not necessarily meeting sometimes even our own needs because our own strategies may not necessarily have been the best for our personal capital. What we wanted was uh, a high quality institutional grade process uh, applied for families where we could go anywhere we could keep turnover low because oftentimes uh, uh, the family accounts may be uh, uh, taxable accounts. They may not be tax deferred or otherwise tax sheltered. Uh, and when that happens, you know, the way you manage a portfolio changes. Mm. So today at Heron Bay, we have uh, three or four types of clients. You know, we have uh, private family wealth. Uh, and in there also, there's a couple of subcategories. You know, majority of our clients are business owners who have had some kind of an exit and they have a substantial pool of capital and their goal may be to preserve it. And then a lot of their uh, funds may be, as I said, in taxable accounts. So they want high quality businesses. They want to keep turnover low, their taxes low. They want active tax management. Uh, and that's what I guess we mean by being stewards. Uh, of capital. On the other side, uh, even in those some of those family accounts, we have younger people who are looking for higher growth rates uh, of the portfolio. Uh, and sometimes they may come in or there might be a big 401k uh, rollover type of situation where we might be able to apply, uh, apply a higher turnover, uh, maybe a little bit more aggressive strategy. But at the end of the day, what we are really trying to do is to uh, provide value to our clients uh, in terms of uh, uh, giving them an institutional grade product, uh, keeping their taxes low, um, working with all the other um, 
components of uh, building and preserving family wealth, like uh, working with their estate planner or working with their CPAs or, or other tax consultants, so that we can, in effect, uh, uh, um, help them preserve, maintain, uh, grow their wealth over time. How would you say that institutional approach that you and your colleagues, you know, honed and understood from pre- your previous life, how would you say um, that approach has landed with the families who may have, you know, as you said, different, you know, different expectations from their from their man- manager? So to, I, I just I'd love to hear how that strategy has actually played out as you came, you know, it's a beautiful concept, but I'm curious about how people actually received like that level of service and that level of kind of like high grade quality, quality um, structure. Actually, it's been very positive, you know. Uh, so depending on the client, you always get varying degrees of uh, sophistication, right? So if you have your family doctor or a surgeon or whatever, who's never really been into finance, uh, they may or may not necessarily understand what we do, but a large majority of our clients are actually business owners. And uh, business ownership and investing are very closely linked because you're essentially answering the same kind of questions, right? How am I going to grow my business? Uh, is this a good investment to make in my business or not? So when we talk about our approach, when we talk about, we are very, uh, we are at heart business analysts, you know, uh, so we don't even call ourselves stock pickers. So when when our approach is uh, looking at businesses, understanding the uh, you know qualitative aspects of the business, the quantitative aspects of business, uh, and 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 showing that this is how we do it, a lot of times the response we get, oh, when uh, private equity came to buy out my company, this is the same way they looked at uh, my business. Okay, so so the approach resonates. Uh, they see that this is a, a logical approach. This is an approach they've actually used uh, maybe all or in part in their own business. And uh, so we've got tremendous word of mouth. Uh, and uh, it's it's caused uh, significant asset growth since the time we started. That's great to hear. And the one thing that you said that was really interesting to me is that you felt to some degree like the institutional constraints, style boxes, expectations were sort of a, um, maybe a, a, somewhat limiting when it comes to like your ability to generate returns and, and run the strategies you want. Um, I, I'm curious about um, how you've gone about changing the way you invest or changing the way that you allocate, you know, based on, you know, kind of the lifting of some of those constraints. Yeah, so um, we are uh, sector uh, agnostic, industry agnostic, so to speak. We'll essentially go to where the best opportunities are. Of course, we have uh, offerings in different market cap segments. So, um, um, so if we find a great business in in the small cap arena, it's it's going to go in a small or mid or small and micro uh, strategy, but. The reality is we don't have to uh, now over diversify. We can concentrate. We can go to where we think the best ideas are, where the best prospects are. And uh, we can also hold for uh, relatively um, longer periods of time, even if things may um, optically look overvalued, but the company uh, uh, has high cash returns on uh, um, its... uh, assets employed to run the business, then uh, we may tend to hold and let the compounding of the business uh, kind of catch up. So so we don't have to be hyperactive. We can uh, be more relaxed. We can do more deep dive. And the reality as somebody who's owned and operated businesses before is that, you know, this quarterly fixation that the street often has is really not very healthy uh, and not meaningful. Uh, because businesses don't change that fast, so uh, so we can we can more patiently watch the evolution of a business to see if it's tracking our thesis or not. And, and of course, there'll be times it's not, and we'll have to cut the business. But essentially, it allows us to go where we see the opportunities are. Great, thank you. In in the introduction to Heron Bay, where you were talking about your strategy, I think you mentioned the word quality, and that word can mean 
different things to different firms and different investment managers. So maybe you can just give us the Heron Bay definition of a quality company. Yeah. So we are not that different than uh, everybody else. If, in fact, uh, uh, I think pretty much all knowledge is, we don't have any original knowledge. We have learned from everybody. Uh, uh, all the greats like Buffett and Munger and, and uh, the Akris of the world and so on and so forth. But essentially, we are just looking for a company that uh, generates uh, sustained free cash flow um, or operating uh, or uh, you know owner earning type of thing. And usually that leads to some kind of a business which has uh, uh, recurring type revenues. Um, you know, um, we like business models that uh, may uh, provide input to another business at, at a low cost. So um, uh, uh, we own many such businesses in our portfolio. Uh, we are looking for high and sustained um, uh, returns on um, the assets employed to to run. The business in cash, uh, you know, uh, we and that typically implies that there's some kind of a durable competitive advantage which you have to unearth. Um, we want that competitive advantage to remain intact for a long period of time. So, we're, if we can find a business like that, and we can find a business which is a reinvestment opportunity, which means that they can keep growing their store base or their uh, install base in software or whatever it might be uh, uh, at a steady clip, uh, which means it'll allow us, uh, allow the value to compound. Uh, so that's the kind of thing we are looking for, a reasonably long runway for growth. And then we are looking for management. Um, we watch the actions of the management very carefully. We we'll dig into the proxy uh, a lot. And essentially we are looking for management that's owner oriented, that's long-term oriented, if it's an owner operator, it's even better for us, you know, because then it reduces some of that, you know, agent uh, principal conflict uh, type of thing. You know, uh, we hope that they have good capital allocation skills because any business that's generating a lot of cash uh, will eventually uh, run out of organic growth opportunities and they might need to deploy that cash somewhere. Uh, so if they can, can they find other projects uh, which are not a reach but in adjacent areas where they can maybe grow their business and add another layer of growth on top and that that that's a capital allocation skill um, or uh, are they empire builders uh, you know uh, so we also look at how they're incented for instance you know uh, are they just incented for growth in revenue or are they incented for profitable growth you know uh, things of that nature you know so so those that's a quality that's a, now the reality is you don't find everything uh, in one company so there'll always be trade offs and you have to see okay what trade offs can you accept and uh, you know is the price low enough for you to accept such a trade off from my understanding your investment process starts with assessing the safety of a business first you say right. that there's not a lot of unique things about your firm, but that's I think that's unfair. I think not every firm starts there. How does that focus on safety influence the kind of new ideas that get brought up in investment meetings? Yeah, so um, if I may take a little detour, and uh, let me just tell you uh, a, a little bit about myself, you know. So I'm I'm really for most part I'm a self-taught investor, and a self-taught investor means you've made all the mistakes in the book plus some more, you know. And uh, uh, I'm I'm as essentially an engineer at heart. I have graduate degrees in engineering. I used to work at top automotive manufacturing firm in research, and part of the research I used to do was to was called statistical optimization. So essentially it's designing engineering systems that will give you a robust performance over a wide variety of different conditions. Does that remind you of something called an all weather portfolio? You know, so essentially there's parallels in what I used to do quantitatively and what I do here. Then as I started investing, um, uh, you start making all these mistakes and then you say, why did I make this mistake? And you go back and you read. So. 
Buffett and Munger, they've been a big influence in, uh, in, in my early investment education because that's one of the first places you go, you start reading the letters. And I remember uh, a quote by Charlie, which says, uh, you know, tell me where I'm going to die so I don't go there, you know. So you naturally, that's the genesis of this thought is, okay, what can kill a business? If you can avoid businesses that are going to die, the other outcomes may actually be acceptable. They might, may not be optimal, but they might be acceptable. So what can kill a business? So we look for those kind of things. So how is the leverage? You know, uh, as like Buffett says, right? Uh, uh, buying a highly levered business is like riding a car with a dagger pointed at, uh, uh, you know, stuck on the steering wheel. You drive very carefully, but one little bump can kill you, yep. you know? And most of the time, if you actually look at it, uh, the world operates in steady state, but then there are disruptions. COVID will happen or, or people will make stupid loans uh, in 2008 or, or people are going to get swept up in a mania in 99 where you're going to have price uh, of a stock being dictated by how many people are going to the website, things of that nature, right? So these kind of things will happen. Uh, and uh, you want your business you have to be able to survive that. So leverage uh, interest coverage, um, accounting manipulation. We'll run some basic uh, numerical tests for that, um, you know, things like that. Uh, also, we will, uh, if we have two kinds of portfolios, discretionary and systematic. For discretionary portfolios, we'll also take a cursory look at the business model before jumping into detail. But is this business model uh, likely to get disrupted? Are there signs of it getting disrupted, you know? Is the industry uh, concentrating or is there a lot of fresh capital coming in? Things of that nature, which kind of will point towards risk, yeah. uh, you know, and if it tends to be more risky than we think it is, we'll just avoid that altogether and move on to the next thing. We don't, keep in mind, we don't have to be in every sector, in every industry. So we have the luxury of doing that. And Heron Bay thinks about valuation after considering, considering safety and quality. I think I know the answer to this, but can a cheap enough valuation ever compensate for the lack of the other two variables? Uh, no, uh, we, we, we are, one of the basic things we are looking for is that over a full cycle, we want a business to earn its cost of capital at least. So, if it's not earning its cost to capital, in other words, it's not going to create any value. So why are we trying uh, to force ourselves? There's no price. Yeah, sure, we may get a re-rate. And we do have some quant strategies that that play more heavily on re-rates. But as a general rule of thumb, and 100% in our discretionary strategies, you know, if we do not think the quality of the business is there, regardless of how cheap it gets, we're probably not going to buy it. And you talk about a company earning its cost of capital over a full cycle. That implies that, you know, to some degree, you guys are making projections about what the business is going to be years out. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how you go about valuing companies and, you know, where does the DCF play in that, if at all? Yeah. So again, um, yeah, sorry to give these conditional type answers, but that's the reality of how we work. Uh, so we have a basic same uh, philosophically, we, we, we run two kinds of strategies, as I said, we run discretionary and systematic. Philosophically, they're the same, you know, in the sense that we are trying to buy uh, really high quality companies at a discount, and hopefully there'll be a, a, a bump up because of a re-rating, and then there'll be long-term compounding internally of the business that's going to generate the value for us. Now, uh, so depending on which strategy we are in, it's very hard to do a DCF uh, for 5,000 stocks, let's say, you know, yep. uh, in a systematic strategy. So there will be, one of the things we do is we try to recast all the statements uh, on an automated basis uh, to better reflect the economic reality of what's going on. So for instance, you know, net income has its issues, um, free cash flow has its issues. You know, today, a lot of businesses are asset light and a lot of the investment in the business is running through the income statement. So we try to make some simple adjustments 
to come up with uh, what we think the true economic earnings of that business are going to be. And same way, we'll, we'll uh, redo the asset base a little bit too. So there we will look at maybe things like uh, what is our economic earnings yield uh, uh, on the market cap and also on the enterprise value. On uh, disc the discretionary side of things, we use typically use an IRR framework and uh, depending upon, uh, uh, so, so that does uh, uh, imply uh, uh, either a simplified DCF or a full-blown DCF, you know, so we, which we will do, you know. So we have a hurdle rate uh, for every company to come in uh, based on the IRR, and that hurdle rate depends upon the cap size uh, of the portfolio. Um, and uh, we may penalize for uh, um, extremely noisy uh, earnings, for instance. You know, if you have less confidence, we may tend, we may end up using a higher hurdle rate, or we may give a benefit to a company where it's very clean and we can see uh, uh, good prospects ahead. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people who come on this podcast say some version of what you guys say is that we're looking for high quality businesses that are trading at a discount. You know, markets are relatively efficient. So one of my favorite questions to ask is what kind of situations allow for safe quality companies to also be meaningfully undervalued? Yeah, so I'm going to talk about some uh, companies, maybe good idea to give some examples and sure. just let us know that uh, that uh, some of them uh, we still own in our portfolio, but this is not a recommendation to buy. Uh, they might be fairly valued now and they may not have that discount. Um, so let's talk about a couple of things. So back in uh, December 22, I think it was, um, I think Meta got down to like maybe five or six times operating income to enterprise value. Um, it was uh, it was a ridiculously low number. And uh, at that time, it was hit by a um, couple of issues. Uh, one of the issues was the ad tracking and targeting, um, and which essentially was Apple switching off and even Google switching off uh, uh, communication um, about uh, uh, about the users to Meta. So the Meta had to essentially go around uh, to figure out ways to increase the ad spend, increase the return on ad spend. Essentially, the way Meta is really an advertising business, a lot of small businesses use it to get to consumers. And if they're not getting a return on the ad spend, they're going to stop spending money. So that was one big issue. The second issue was that uh, Mark Zuckerberg, um, who is the owner operator, uh, invested heavily in, uh, quote unquote, the metaverse. And, uh, you know, the street didn't like it. Uh, often the street has a much shorter term view than we have. And uh, as a result of all that, the stock basically cratered. So it's around that time it caught our eye uh, and uh, we looked at the business and uh, we felt that, uh, you know, the basic engine in the business was good. Um, and they were making efforts to mitigate. They were also starting uh, to get traction on their efforts to mitigate the adverse impact of ad tracking and targeting. And at the same time, um, uh, you know, it they could switch off the metaverse spend and, and the true economics would, would reveal itself. In addition, Mark Zuckerberg on balance has made good decisions. You know, Instagram was a good buy. They they, they move sure they have uh, they've had their share of controversy, but he's an excellent operator. So that's one of the reasons uh, you could, and that's what we uh, say when we say follow the numbers, not the narrative, because the narrative can get really bad really quick, and it can impact the stock. Same thing. Another company in our uh, international portfolios is uh, uh, TSM, um, you know, Taiwan Semiconductor. And, you know, I don't know, maybe it was a year, year and a half ago, the stock was uh, maybe uh, at 80 or $90. And today it's much higher. Why? Because everybody was afraid of the geopolitical risk. Yeah. You know, what the disconnect was, if you are concerned about TSM having trouble because of geopolitics, 
shouldn't Apple that manufactures most of its phones in China also have faced the same problem? You know, uh, but Apple stock was was moving along perfectly fine. So um, when you see disconnects like that, uh, you have to make some kind of a judgment call if the if the business remains good. A third category could be uh, we invest in spin-offs. So one of the companies we invested in uh, is Vontier. And Vontier spun off from Fortive, which is really a, it's a Danaher pedigree, right? And, uh, you know, so they all have their own version of the Danaher business system, which essentially is a system started by, uh, um, is based in large part on Deming's work. Deming is considered the father of quality. You know, and he basically revolutionized the manufacturing industry in Japan. Now, here's this company that's been spun off. So anytime there's a spin off, there's uneconomic reasons for selling. You know, stocks get sold off uh, and it got sold off because it was too small. And then they had some headwinds again, because essentially uh, there were uh, uh, the fuel pumps, which is the business they're in, one of the businesses they're in. Uh, but major portion of the business they're in, uh, required you to install chip uh, readers as opposed to those things that you slide through. And uh, that mandate caused a lot of business to be moved up. And uh, in a sense, uh, you know, revenues uh, were affected and profits were affected. But on balance, we felt the business was good and we kept uh, really buying the stock as it went down. So there could be many reasons. We don't know what those reasons are, but we are happy to take advantage of it if we can make sense of them and we think that they are temporary. And if you determine that a business is indeed safe and exhibits quality, how likely are you to sell when the valuation discount diminishes or even is completely gone? Yeah, so I think I alluded to it earlier, uh, is really there are two sources of return that that come into play. One is if your business is severely, um, it, it significantly below in, intrinsic value, there could be a re-rate, you know. But then if you have a good business, uh, almost axiomatically, the intrinsic value should be increasing at a pretty steady clip, right? So um, we are, loath to sell a good business just because it's reached its intrinsic value. It has to significantly overshoot its intrinsic value for us to sell. Yeah, we may trim uh, some if it gets too large a portion of the portfolio um, and things just for risk management purposes. But typically, we will hold on to the bulk of our holding if, if it, uh, as long as the intrinsic value is growing at the rate we would like it to grow. And you mentioned this in one of your previous re previous responses, but there is certainly a contrarian aspect of your process where you focus on the facts and the numbers and try to ignore the narrative. I'm curious what that means exactly. I mean, is it, is it like about noise elimination? Is it about you know, like trying to understand what the market's thinking and where you're different. I'm just trying to get a sense of like when when you say focus on the facts and the numbers, how does and 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 trying to separate that from the narrative. How does that actually play out in practice? So, um, before I became a public equity markets investor, uh, I used to own and operate uh, a manufacturing engineering firm. And uh, I was a partner in it. And one of the things we would always look for is um, companies uh, that we may want to acquire. And of course, there would be times we'd sell machinery, we'd buy machinery, we'd do all those kind of things. So if you actually go down to the very basics, first principles, you know, what do you want a business to do? You want business to earn more and more profit over a period of time. You want it to have high returns on capital. And, and, and essentially, if you know that you're going to make more and more money every year, your business is going to get more and more valuable. It's as simple as that. So, um, in fact, Ben Graham talks about an intelligent investor, right? Um, an investment operation is one uh, which promises uh, the safety of your principal and a reasonable return. And 
businesses, investing is best when it's most business-like. So that's what we're doing. We're just looking at numbers. We're looking at the management. We are giving, we are making allowances for, uh, in, in terms of time, for management strategies to play out. And we are ignoring uh, the chatter as much as possible. Uh, you know, because today, you know, just look at it. You know, six months ago, Google was an also ran in artificial intelligence. Today, uh, it seems like it's it's uh, it's the best company in artificial intelligence. So the market can't seem to make up its mind. Yeah. So if we are going to rely on that, you know, you're going to be like that manic depressive person in uh, Ben Graham's book. So instead, do what Buffett says. Uh, in fact, he writes it in his owner's manual if, uh, for uh, Berkshire Hathaway stock, is that uh, follow the growth in operating earnings. Follow the growth in uh, uh, in the actual businesses. And that's what we are trying to do. So when we say uh, ignore the narrative, follow the numbers, that's, that's all we are trying to do to the best of our ability. You've started to discuss the various strategies that Harem Bay runs, but... Um, as you mentioned, you run both discretionary and systematic strategies. I'm curious about how separate those strategies are. Do they complement each other? Um, do they, are there, you know, there may be different number of securities in them and different security weightings, but I'm just curious about, you know, how you view those as totally standalone separate, separate products, or there are synergies in the, and, and, um, value to having them both under the same roof? Um, let's take the last part first. How about that? Sure. Okay. So uh, as I said, they stem from the same philosophical root. We want to be, we want to grow uh, our client's capital at a healthy clip. And we want to do it with as less risk as possible, which means safety is important, quality is important, and valuation is important. Having said that, if you actually look at the way a quant works, um, and by the way, uh, you know, people think quant, they, I don't know, this is all kinds of uh, flavors of quant, right? But Ben Graham was an original quant, if you really think about it, right? He was, uh, you know, except for Geico, I think pretty much everything was based upon, you know, some measures of value and things, things of that nature. So one of the things that benefits us from looking at things from both sides is, um, well, there are few advantages. First thing is it it shows you some base rates, you know, and uh, it allows us for better appreciation of base rates. What I've found is that people who are like a traditional finance people, they have too much of an inside view. They have mm. too much of a confidence in their ability to predict how well the business is going to do five years from now and 10 years from now or even a year from now. Sure. You know, and uh, actually when you look at the numbers, most of the analyst projections for earnings and things like that, even for a year out, are actually wrong. So it gives you a great appreciation for base rates. Second thing, what a systematic process does is it removes bias and noise. You know, so bias and noise are two separate things. Uh, bias means you're consistently wrong or consistently right or consistently on one side, consistently on the other side. Noise is a lot of variation around your mean prediction. You know, so, um, what systematic strategies have allowed us is that, hey, so when we run, even for our discretionary um, strategies, we'll always run our systematic tests on those uh, names to see, hey, uh, are we attributing uh, uh, an outcome to this um, business that is so far out in the left field that it's not happened in... Uh, that normally does not happen, in which case it gives us pause. So it's like a check, you know? Uh, on the other hand, if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, uh, discretionary strategies, uh, sometimes, you know, you, you uh, there might be changes that are happening. Uh, businesses change, right? It used to sure. be 20 years ago, most businesses, heavy intangible assets, not so many intangible assets. Today, there's more intangible assets than there's tangible assets, right? Now, how does that mean? Uh, what does that mean when you look at the statements? You know, and a good analyst 
when they are trying to come up with the true economics of the business, will 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 think of making some um, adjustments and to really understand the true capture the true economics of the business. And watching and doing that work as an analyst can then inform you to change your systematic process to also do the same kind of things. So I'm not sure if the answer is very clear, but yeah, it's a feedback loop. Systematic helps discretionary and discretionary helps systematic. Also things like maybe a tax law changed, you know, sure. uh, and uh, now you have to uh, figure out that from the time the tax law changed, you are doing, uh, when you do your systematic tests, you know, you have to, you have to kind of do things a little bit differently, or maybe a revenue recognition standard changed. So what does that mean? Because if if you're just looking at numbers and you don't understand the context behind the numbers, you can make mistakes with the systematic process. And what is the profile of a client that um, is interested in and in, in is, is well suited for systematic strategy versus a discretionary strategy? And I guess the addendum to that is: Do you put people? Do you often recommend that people have both, right? Like a, like a, like almost like a, whatever, whatever your allocation is to this strat, to this this market cap spectrum. Why don't you have one systematic and one discretionary? Maybe talk a little bit about how they play in client yeah. portfolios. Yeah. So um, uh, that's that's an excellent question, and uh, there are a lot of great investors out there. So, you know, I remember when uh, 20 years back, I think it was Ken Hebner and CGM Focus Fund. Fantastic return, extreme volatility. To the point that uh, other than the manager, probably nobody held the fund uh, through and through, right? And that's a problem, you know? And even if you're quality heavy, uh, which typically quality tends to go, uh, to be hurt less in downturns, uh, still that volatility can shake people out. So if people are in just one strategy, even if it might have alpha, uh, they might not stick it stick with it through the end, no matter how much education you do. And part of our job as a wealth manager is to really educate our clients. Sure. When you can have multiple strategies, each with alpha against their own benchmark, but have a correlation which is less than one, preferably 60% with each other. Sure. So it's kind of like efficient market frontier, right? You could you could then combine the strategies and then you will have lower overall volatility in the portfolio. So we try to encourage people uh, to build a base, let's say, then the second thing also uh, uh, to go along with that is the asset location problem, right? So in other words, uh, you don't want to put a high turnover strategy necessarily in a taxable account. Sure. So, so depending on when the clients come in, we would like to build them an ensemble of strategies. We'd like to do it in a thoughtful manner where the low turnover strategies go into taxable accounts and the higher turnover strategies go in the tax deferred or tax free accounts. And when I think about systematic strategies, I often think of them being diversified into dozens or even hundreds of securities. You mentioned that there's all different kinds of flavors of quant and, and it's, you know, it's hard to paint them all with the same brush. But I mean, from my understanding, here on Bay runs some very concentrated sub stub, sorry, sub 20% uh, systematic stock funds. I guess I'm curious about the the reason for that level of concentration in a strategy that, you know, I think traditionally uh, is more diversified. Yes. Yeah. So actually, even when you look at traditional mutual fund, for instance, you know, you look at some of the best performing funds are almost always concentrated funds. Yeah. So if you're able to isolate the economic characteristics that are going to lead to value creation and buy those, uh, those economic characteristics, you should, in theory, have better returns uh, the more concentrated you get. Sure. Your volatility is also going to increase the more concentrated you get. So if you're using the strategy in an ensemble, so you could have a core strategy, uh, which could be discretionary, or it could be uh, systematic of larger number of names, let's say 25 to 40 names. And then you could layer on 
uh, a diversifier strategy, which could be 10 or 15 names, and which is more concentrated, which is trying to isolate certain economic characteristics uh, to have a, a high return stream. And hopefully that's not correlated with uh, your uh, base strategy where most of your money is. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to move on because, you know, as you know, what I'm focused on, I was very intrigued to see um, that you run a microcap strategy. You sure don't see a lot of investment firms with that these days. I would love to hear about why you guys continue to believe in microcap as a strategy. So I don't know where it was said and who said it, but uh, it was said that cheapness is its own catalyst. You know, and uh, micro caps and small caps in general are historically cheap. You know, I think this level of uh, uh, cheapness between, let's say, S&P, if you were to do the P, just simply the PE of S&P 500 uh, versus Russell 2000, we are at levels which were seen in like 1999 or 2000. So first of all, if the pond is good, you want to go fish there. You know? Secondly, uh, um, I believe that in the micro cap and small world, there's a large dispersion in quality. In general, the quality is poorer, for sure. Yeah. But there's a large dispersion in quality. So uh, you can find some really high quality names at a relatively cheap price. In fact, we are running double digit free cash flow yields on our small and micro strategy, you know? And if you can do that, then that gives you an opportunity to build a portfolio. Will it necessarily, we don't, we cannot predict the future. We don't know when the cycle will turn, but as a prudent asset allocator, you know, it makes sense to have at least some portion of your money in what arguably might be the cheapest asset class today. Uh, in the U.S. market, which is small and micro cap value. Yeah, you you know I am a you know there's a lot of confirmation bias there, but you know I am a believer in what you're right. saying. Uh, you know the other thing that I saw, um, which we almost never see in public markets, is uh, ADR focused strategies. I, I'm curious about why playing in that niche potentially could potentially lead to an opportunity to generate excess returns. Are there some structural inefficiencies? You know with ADRs that people may not be familiar with? Uh, so um, essentially, uh, for, interna uh, for, for international, uh, if you look at it, it's also been relatively cheap. And international value has been relatively cheap. Really, we it's a diversifier for us, for some, for some or actually a lot of our clients. And... Uh, the issue that we run into is we run SMAs. Yeah. So all these, some of these guys might be custodying at Schwab, for instance. Somebody is custodying somewhere else. So in reality, other than buying dual listed stocks, ADRs, uh, and things like that, or even like pink sheet stocks uh, of foreign issuers, big foreign issuers, there's really no way for us to get into that international value. Sure. Really, this is just an expression of that. So it's a diversifier and it's cheap. Got it. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing I'm always curious about uh, with a small firm without a huge team is how many strategies you feel like you can run well. So if you think about between the systematic and discretionary strategies, Heron Bay runs a bunch of different strategies with a relatively small team. I guess I'm curious about how you manage the workload so that you don't have to satisfy in certain areas or you don't sacrifice returns in certain strategies, um, you know, as you as you try to run a lot of different portfolios. Right. That's an excellent question. So let's talk first systematic um, and then let's talk discretionary. So in reality, um, what you want to do, we want to build, our systematic strategies are also designed to be all weather. They're not supposed to be regime dependent. Like I know there are lots of Wall Street firms that will tell you this is this regime is coming and that regime is going. And, and I don't know how accurate that stuff is, 
I just want a portfolio that that uh, or a strategy that'll that'll give me reasonably good returns in all kind of economic situations. So uh, we spent a lot of time building those, and it's been I've been building those for almost a decade now, you know. But here's the thing: that once you've come up with something and you've done rigorous statistical testing and you've done all kinds of uh, proper uh, protocols that needed to vet the strategy then you really don't want to go about changing your strategy that often. Because what that will do is it will increase the dispersion of your strategy. You know? sure. You'll actually, uh, you know, and um, that's a, there's a technical term for that in, in quality engineering. It's called tinkering, you know. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, if you tinker, uh, then uh, what ends up happening is, is your, your, your output just changes dramatically. So, yes, there'll be times they're not going to perform that well. There are going to be times they're going to perform great. But so... So it's really more like a set and forget it, but you want to monitor it uh, for things like, hey, uh, is there something really fundamentally changing in the way business operates? There's fundamentally something changing in the way the standards are written, which impact what these numbers mean. And then you go ahead and make those changes. So uh, uh, once that is done, uh, we don't have to really spend a lot of time. On the discretionary side, we don't spend time on every every uh, security. We have a curated list. Um, part of it comes from screening. Part of it comes from our experience. And that curated list may be a couple of hundred names. So um, our typical way of operation is we will look at a company that interests us. Uh, we, will, uh, uh, we will build a model on it. And we'll come up with an IRR target. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, based on our IR target, we'll figure out what the price is. Most often, nine out of ten times, maybe ninety-five out of a hundred times, uh, the stock will be too overpriced for where we want it to be. So we'll just put it on the shelf, and we want to be four hours ready. Uh, put alerts on, and if the targets are hit, then we go back and recheck all our work, and and hopefully within half a day or a day. We can uh, we can pull the trigger if the opportunity presents itself. So yes, it is a lot of work, uh, and uh, who knows if we are satisfying. But there's also this. Uh, Danny Kahneman has this great quote, right? It says thinking too much about a problem uh, can, uh, or about a company can increase your confidence, may not necessarily increase the accuracy of your analysis. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's sure. a point of diminishing returns, and uh, we're trying to get to that. But to support our uh, um, uh, clients and we call them partners, you know, we actually have been adding staff. So uh, just recently, last month, we added a, a sharp uh, uh, a young man from uh, who just graduated from uh, Northwestern uh, CFA, wants to move back to Michigan. So it's a great fit for us, and we're very lucky to have him. And a concept that I think is really interesting. You know, when you run, especially when you run concentrated portfolios, is competition for capital. So I'm curious about the hurdle rate when it comes to an, a new idea getting in the portfolio, assuming you're fully invested. What is, is that just mostly based on IRR because you've already done the quality assessment? Is it a, is it a holistic assessment of business value and people that, that, you know, that's required? I'm just, I'm just curious about how, um, you think about comp, you know a healthy competition for capital within the portfolio. Yeah, I think arguably that's the hardest part of portfolio construction management. You know, and uh, okay, do you know you don't want to uh, boot out uh, a holding only to see uh, the one you replaced it with uh, lag the one you just let go. Uh, so uh, I think it's more of an art than a science. And uh, it's very clear cut and systematic because you know you have you have set of buy rules, you have a set of sell rules. It just does it automatically, so you don't have to think too much. But yeah, in discretionary, you have to think about all of those things. You know, uh, if uh, if you have a really high quality business with a compelling IRR, uh, and uh, you want to put it in the portfolio, then what is it in the portfolio that you're least confident about? So it yeah. could be many things. It could be confidence about the business model. It could be the current valuation of the security that you're looking to uh, sell or trim. Uh, all of those things uh, play a part. And you mentioned being self-taught and making every mistake in the book and then some. Having made a lot of mistakes myself, I always like to talk to managers about them. 
Is there an investment mistake that was so profound that has, it has forever changed the way you make decisions? <laughs> There's so many. So I remember I started off, I have moved from the quantitative side to being more of a, uh, understanding the other environment because it's, it's normal for somebody with my background to do that. And I remember it does not change the way, uh, maybe it has, but I remember back, uh, oh, I know it's uh, maybe 2005 or so. I mean, I was screening and I was seeing all these reverse Chinese uh, mergers showing up. It was such pristine file. It was like, wow. And uh, of course I loaded up on them only to realize that, hey, um, you know, the cash that they said was there wasn't there or, or you know, the books were misstated. And that gave me a really healthy appreciation for some markets I, I actually do not want to invest in. So one of the things we you will not find us doing is probably buying VIEs in China, mm. you know, uh, stuff of that nature. Um, the other big mistake, which is recurrent and uh, has always been in, in, uh, in buying businesses with... Uh, either too high a leverage, which has come back to bite me, um, uh, or uh, buying businesses where the business model is inherently not as entrenched as you'd like. Uh, mm -hmm. and so, so in other words, um, like one of our portfolio holdings, and this is not a recommendation of buy or sell, is fact set. But fact set's a pretty entrenched business. You know, uh, it's very hard to pull it out. Uh, you know, on the other hand, there could be, uh, you could be an apparel uh, retailer. And today, uh, it's real fashionable for you to buy that stuff. And tomorrow, uh, nobody wants to buy that. And I've made all of those kind of mistakes, you know, because the numbers look good, you end up buying the fashion retailer only to realize, you know, it's it's subject to the whims and fickles of, of things. Uh, lately, most of the, we, so what we do is we try to do a pre-mortem, especially on the discretionary side, on any business that we are going to add to the portfolio. And uh, we also do a postmortem uh, of every security that we felt didn't perform the way it should have performed, even though it made money for us. You know, and uh, if you look at our uh, mistakes, typically the mistakes are um, in areas that we know we need to avoid, but we end up doing it anyway. Like for instance, uh, we hate transformative acquisitions. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and uh, we sometimes allow that to slip through because the story was so great. Or the numbers yeah. was or the price was so cheap, yeah. and uh, we said okay, and only it's come back to bite us. Or maybe the company was over levered, uh, or maybe the business model was changing so rapidly it was not as entrenched as we thought it was, you know. And uh, those are some of the mistakes I think uh, that have happened maybe more than once. Sure, thank you for mm -hmm. that, and. I guess one thing I'm a little confused about as I think about your strategies is what is the profile of a company that fits in a discretionary strategy that, you know, that, or sorry, well, maybe either going either way, like a company that, that fits in the discretionary strategy that, but for some reason doesn't fit in the systematic strategy. Like, I mean, you, it seems like the quality overlay is the same. You guys are looking at a lot of the same variables, why would the rules and the models come up with different businesses than you know what what your what the kind of things you come up with when you're reading K's and Q's? So actually, there is a, there is overlap. There is overlap between what systematic picks and what uh, discretionary picks. However, what ends up happening is that uh, for a discretionary model, one of the first questions we start is, do I understand the business and can I predict where it's going to be? Sure. Uh, with some degree of confidence, five or 10 years down the road. And sometimes we can't answer that question very well to our satisfaction. So we have to move on. So a typical business like that would be maybe in the tech space or in yeah. the medical space, you know, uh, where we cannot really uh, uh, understand the business that well and we are forced to move on. But systematic is just simply looking at numbers, the trajectory of numbers over time, uh, and it's backward looking. So sure. it might make mistakes, but it passes the rules and we don't override the model. So we end up buying it. 
Does that answer your question? No, no, that, that is, that is. It was just the degree uh, of understandability and predictability. I think, yeah, right? no, I think that's a good way to frame it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you guys are about. You said I think you're about four years into Heron Bay. I, I'm curious if we're having this conversation in seven years, what would success at Heron Bay look like to you and your partners? Yeah. So that's a really great question. And actually, uh, we have been so busy building the business that we have not thought about it. So as a group, we actually did think about it. So, uh, um, you know, well, the first thing is we are here to serve our clients and partners, right? So we want to provide that exceptional service uh, to them. Um, and we want to be... Um, so Heron Bay places a lot of emphasis on learning organization. So we want to remain a learning organization. We want to maintain that cognitive diversity. So we have, uh, uh, today we have four or five, actually five people, one of them sparingly, but four people that touch the investments. You know, Jerry Sizer, who's one of the founders, and he's in his 70s. Uh, I'm in my 50s. We have uh, a couple of guys in their 30s, you know. Um, most of a traditional finance background. Uh, but Jerry and I have both started um, uh, our own businesses. I mean, he, he started Sizer Capital uh, and then this business. Uh, so, and I started another business. Uh, so, um, so we have the owner operator kind of mindset. So we wanna have that uh, range of um, uh, cognitive diversity that comes with age, cognitive diversity that comes with different experiences, cognitive diversity that comes from, I'm, uh, you know, I grew up in a different part of the world for the first 20 years of my life, you know? So uh, all of that kind of stuff, I think, adds to um, different ways of looking at things. We want to be the person that Charlie always says, right? If any year that you haven't destroyed a favorite idea is a bad mm -hmm. year, we want to remain that firm that we are actually actively looking and we have active dissent uh, when we uh, meet in the investment team, you know, uh, not in terms of uh, idea dissent, not in terms of, you know, uh, nice collegial atmosphere, but still we want to have that active debate. Sure. So those are the kind of things that are important to us. Uh, uh, and we want it to be a place where people love, uh, you know, uh, to come to work every day. Yeah. Um, notice that we have not really, I've not really talked much about the size or anything like that because I believe that if we do all these things well and we have a great, we will have, we'll continue to have a great investment process. Yep. And that should lead to growth for us. And hopefully that growth allows us to give back more to the community uh, around us. In, in a situation where an institution likes what you're doing, you're built for institutional quality. Is that is that a customer or a client that you would say no thank you to, or you would consider institutional the right institutional investors in addition to lots of you know kind of family wealth? Yeah, we'd love the right institutional investor if they buy into our process and they don't micromanage and second guess us. You know, um, uh, we'd love to have uh, have them. You know, in fact, even with our clients, we don't want every client. We want clients who buy into the way we like do things. Because we want to protect the research. We don't have any marketers. You know, uh, it's portfolio managers, uh, research analysts, director of research. We're all research analysts. Sure. And we want to we want to sp uh, put that time where it counts, which is building and managing a great portfolio. So uh, to the degree that people understand what we do, um, it's less overhead in terms of calls coming in and things of that nature. And it allows us all to compound well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Just to, was curious about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so Chet, this has been awesome. Uh, loved hearing the story. So we're going to close with the question we ask all of our manager guests, and it's about the opportunity set that's in front of you. What do you think is the most underappreciated aspect of the opportunity set in front of Heron Bay today from an investment perspective? Well, um, Let's, let's take it from investing and business perspective, both. You know, we do see that, uh, you know, there's a generational transfer of wealth coming. Yep. There are a lot of people that, that uh, especially in the younger generation, that need to be educated, you know. And uh, um, so we are ideally placed uh, to add value uh, in that context. 
you know, we have a nice client base. Uh, there's some generational transfers happening. Uh, and I think there is, uh, uh, there's going to be more happening and they'll be looking for people with a coherent, uh, grounded philosophy of managing money so where we can add value, you know. Sure. Uh, I also think that most people uh, underappreciate how powerful compounding is. Yep. If you can add a couple of uh, hundred basis points to the index return, you know, uh, the result can be quite spectacular or, over the long term. You know, but uh, hopefully we can do we can do that and more. Well, Chet, this has been great. Thank you so much for being on Compounders. Uh, I think you know you guys have a diversity of strategies um, that makes this a like a kind of a unique conversation for the seventy plus we've had. So, thanks for being on, and uh, love to do it again sometime. Thank you very much, Ben. Appreciate your time. And as I mentioned, I've learned a lot from your podcast. I'm truly honored to be on. Yeah, thanks, Chet. Chet mentioned a number of stocks on his podcast. I do not own any of them. 